Hey guys, thanks a lot for joining me. I'm so excited to dive into the Bible with you today. I hope you're ready and excited along with me. We're going to be diving into the final portion of chapter 10 in, in the book of Hebrews. So grab your copy of Bi the, uh, the Bible or God's Word and let's dive in together. So let me just start off this this uh, this study with with an interesting word study. And I just want to kind of give you guys a little introduction before we, we a lot of times just in in true fashion, I give you a little introduction, then we dive into God's word. So today's introduction, um, I want to, I want to point to the word patience. As we talked about last month, last week, um, we were we were unpacking the idea of what what is judgment. What's this whole idea of judgment? Uh, and, and what does God have to do with judgment? And will we be judged, et cetera, et cetera? And so here's this week where the writer dives into this in over his head. He's diving right into it, and he's going to open it up uh, for us. And I can't wait to hopefully, with my limited ability, be able to show you this. Now, the word patience is the word. Pat patience is an interesting word. It sounds good to our ears, right? It's like a positive word. Uh, because it describes an act of kindness. But patience is an act of letting an offense pass by unnoticed, unnoticing, or, or um, passing it by, letting it pass by unnoticed. Patience means giving grace to showing consideration, by showing consideration to someone who deserves something less. Does that make sense? Patience is giving grace to some, show, by showing, ah, I can't talk today. Um, grace is the means, patience is the means of giving grace by showing consideration to someone who deserves something less. But patience is limited, right? It has a limit. And the word patience implies a limit, doesn't it? Uh, to call someone patient is to say that they could be responding differently than they are. Um, they, they could be unpatient, impatient. Does that make sense? It suggests that sooner or later their patience may run out. Is this the case? That it, is this the case with God? Um, what's your What's your God view? What is your knowledge of God? Do you see Him as patient? Do you see Him as impatient? Um, and so the word is so interesting because though it sounds good now, it carries the potential for really unpleasant things in the future. Does it not? Uh, don't know if all you guys grew up with uh, a strict a strict home, a strict house. But uh, it's the similar, it's a similar uh, layout or, or expectation that, you know, though my dad or mom is, is exercising patience with me in my disobedience or bad behavior, it suggests that they could one day run out. The patience could run out. So the Bible says the Lord is patient and long-suffering in withholding his judgments against us and against sin. So he is patient not only towards the unbeliever, but also for the rebellious saint. Hmm. But sooner or later, in both cases, his patience runs out. His patience runs out. For the unbeliever, the Lord's patience expires at the death of their body. Did you know that? His patience runs out, and it just ex it, there's an expiration date on every unbeliever. It's their, the death of their body. As we learned earlier in the study, everyone is appointed to die at some point, <laughs> once, and then after they die comes judgment. That's what the scripture shows us. But this principle is also true for believers. The Lord is patient in withholding his judgments against us for our disobedience to his word. Clearly, the conscience, the consequence of our rebellion are very different than those of an unbeliever who lives in the rebellion, in rebellion to the gospel itself. Nevertheless, there are consequences on both sides. So I hope that makes sense. And when the Lord's patience runs thin, we will experience the discipline of the Lord. I'm sorry, I don't have like this amazing flowery message for you today. This is, this is the truth. Hopefully it's sobering to you right now. Um, even more sobering, we may face the prospect of diminished eternal reward. Scripture lays out. You ever thought about that? Um, at our judgment, especially uh, our diminished reward, may especially be if our life was one of significant rebellion. It's true. 
The Apostle John warns us of this potential when he says, 2 John verse 8, it says this, Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. It's interesting commentary, don't you think? We may put at risk what we gain in the past through future rebellion. So there's a reward in the future promised to those who live in the now according to to God's word, per the Holy Spirit's inspiration. So while we rejoice in the grace we've received from our patient Heavenly Father, this week, this lesson's all about not overlooking that His patience has a limit. His patience has a limit. Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. That's a big one, right? This is where we find the writer's thoughts this morning. Um, <laughs> this morning for me. Um, in our study of Hebrews. So wherever you're at right now, this is where we're at right now. (laughs) So he has reached his fourth warning of his letter, where he addresses the consequences of his readers returning to a life of false worship under the Old Covenant. Do you you, you remember where we left off last week, my, my previous lesson? We were talking about false worship and the consequences thereof. And I said, hey, you're gonna have to wait to see what happens to those who do false worship. What's the consequence? This warning that this writer of Hebrews is talking about. Okay, so so what happens if I do false worship? What if I get swept in it, into this thing accidentally and I'm... What happens? So hopefully we clear this up today. So in chapters 10, verses 19 through 25, last week, we covered that the writer issued th- three lettuces. Not the leafy lettuce, but let us's exhortations. Uh, These commands directed the believer to stand firm in their newfound faith in the blood of Christ and in what the blood of Christ did. To continue in their confession of hope in the resurrection of Christ, he said, let us continue. Remember, let us. And then to continue gathering, he said, let us continue to gather with the New Testament church. Um, so, So standing firm, uh, continue in your, in your confession of the hope of resurrection. And number three was don't stop gathering together, which is very unique, uh, interesting timing with our uh, pandemic situation with COVID-19. Wow, that's timely. But what might happen to a believer who fails to heed these three lettuces? Hmm, well, what are the consequences for spurning the Lord who died to save us? You might ask. Or how will he respond to the believer once his patience runs out, you might ask? Or, uh, well, I'm, I'm just saying that these questions roll around in my mind. So I just, I am sure they're running around in your mind. Well, now the writer now issues the fourth warning to address these questions. Okay, so take your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 10, 26 through 31. Let's read it. Says, it says this, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think they will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded us as unclean, the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Perhaps you've heard all these verses before. Um, So the writer begins by naming a certain group of Christians. Who are these Christians? Well, we know one thing about their character, about their behavior, is that they were sinning willfully. Sinning willfully. What, what does it mean to sin willfully? Well, first, notice that it's, it's expressed as a continuing action. One that, that starts and does not end. Interesting. The writer is referring to a Christian who runs after something sinful and doesn't come back. Running after something sinful and doesn't come back. Secondly, attribute of someone who willfully sins. In this context, the sin he's worried about must have been that at abandoning of abandoning the new covenant 
and returning to a life under the old covenant. So, so worship practices specifically. So stopping, st- stopping what they were living in freedom and new covenant uh, practices to back to the old, the old covenant animal sacrifices to be specific. This sin was willful because they had made a deliberate choice against what they had been taught. Think about that. The writer says they received the knowledge of the truth. So they received it. They knew the apostles' teaching of the new covenant. So that's, that's not the problem. So they knew that, that Christ was the only sacrifice they needed. Yet, as the writer said back in chapter 5, they weren't able to discern good from evil because of their spiritual maturity. Hmm. So they have become apostate though they remain a child of God by grace. Hmm. Okay, so you see that in back in chapter 5, a little insight as to what those willful sinners <laughs> really had for an, attrib- an attribute of their character and their behavior. But this warning applies equally to other situations today. So let's bring it back to today, where Christians are sinning willfully. I'm sure you know a few. I, I'm sure you know a few. Um, <laughs> there's, I think we've all been guilty of this, right? Anytime a believer chooses to live in a way that is contrary to the profession of their faith, they are also at risk. For example, if a Christian abandons his Christian walk for worldly pursuits, they are sinning willfully. If he or she stops assembling with other Christians, stops studying the Bible, stops praying, stops living for Christ, this is a travesty. Such a person is also testing the patience of the Lord, according to Scripture. Or if a Christian adopts a lifestyle or a pattern or behavior that is contrary to doctrine and teaching and good witness, like a Christian who chooses to live a homosexual lifestyle or engages in fornication as a regular routine, is sinning willfully. Or a Christian who is routinely dishonest, routinely routinely violent, routinely ungodly, habitual, one might say, or, or a Christian who lives in slavery to addictions or lust. These are all the same thing, willful sinning, and all, and, and all risk exhausting the patience of the Lord. This is the point of what I'm trying to get at. So what do you think becomes of a slave who lives in disobedience to his master? For such a person, the writer says there's no longer remaining a sacrifice for sins. He's referring to a sacrifice that that were performed, sacrifices that were performed under the old covenant, so he can draw upon the principle found in the new law, in the in the covenant, the law. In the law, there were certain offenses like murder, adultery, blasphemy, and others that were not covered by sacrifice. The law of Moses made no provision for the person who intentionally committed one of those sinful acts. Did you guys know that? You couldn't show up at the temple with a certain number of animals, like 73 doves. <laughs> just inter- yeah, I'm just being, I'm not serious. But you couldn't show up with a bunch of goats or a bunch of sheep or doves and absolve yourself from certain sins. The only remedy under the law for those sins, yep, you guessed it, death. Yikes. The writer calls this setting aside the law of Moses in verse 28. He means ignoring what God had instructed in the truth of his word. So that's really what the base of what this is, is not just bad behavior, but it's ignoring, it's a willful ignorance of God's word and his truth. So if a Jew crossed out, crossed one of those lines, they knew what their penalty was, and that penalty was severe. In verse 27, the writer said, anyone who traded obedience under the Under the old covenant for a life of willful disobedience faced a terrifying outcome. He mentions a fire. Yikes, a fire that consumes God's adversaries. That's a reference to number 16 where a group of men were were consumed by fire from heaven for crossing one of those lines. I think it's interesting, and I'll just add this, that a lot of times in our worship environments, worship cultures, that, that we actually... We encourage singing songs about fire and consuming. And um, a lot of times the verses in scripture, (laughs) almost all of them, 
except for the tongues of fire and, and Pentecost, um, are talking about a, a, a penalty or a, a, a consuming fire as, as the payment of some sort of sin. And so I think it's interesting how we, how we go about singing songs about the consuming fire um, fanning into flame <laughs> and things like that. So anyway, I grew up singing songs like that. Um, so, so therefore, we see there are again there's a there's a there's a contrast between the greater the 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 old covenant and the new covenant and how much greater the new covenant is. Um, the new covenant really is. In verse twenty nine, we sh- we should be sh- we should expect um, exactly what we need to forsake in uh, the new and the greater covenant. So there are some choices and decisions that may lead us into a shipwrecked faith. Walking away from our faith community, for example, or bankrupting our personal testimony is a crisis in our relationship with the Lord. Do you see it like that? It's not just like, hey, I'm going to go peace out and go find a new church. I'm talking about people who go, I'm out. I'm done. I'm stepping away from my faith community. The writer says it's like trampling Christ under your feet. Let that sink in for a second. In the east, the sole of your foot, this is interesting, I did this little, I didn't I didn't know this until I read this about um, ancient Near East tradition, the sole of your foot is, is an offensive and degrading symbol. To trample something under your foot was absolutely the most degrading symbolic gesture you could possibly act out. To trample something under your foot or someone under your foot means to treat them with utter contempt Secondly, when we follow other gods, we, re- we regard as unclean the blood of the covenant. Do you guys remember, back to my first point, this about souls of your feet, it just hit me. I think there was a president, I think it was President Bush, who visited a country, and he had a shoe, he had a shoe thrown at him. Well, that was a gesture of like how much they despised President Bush. Anyway, I, dig- I digress. Secondly, when we follow other gods, we regard as unclean the blood of the covenant. So picture the blood that paid the price for your sins forever on the Holy of Holies in the heavenly tabernacle. When we follow other gods, we regard that as worthless. To worship in any other context besides the new covenant church means we believe the blood of Christ is common, without power or significance. It's it's just one way. It's just one, one possible way uh, when, we, when we do commit false worship. Instead, we seek the power of God, God elsewhere. We go other places, right? Christians who join in pagan rituals, New Age practices, or any other cults. It's huge right now. Huge. Taking, sweeping across our globe. They're taking and, immerse, and, and immersing themselves in cult and cult uh, practices are taking immense risk that a jealous God will continue without judgment in patience. That's a pretty big risk. It's a pretty big assumption to make. Finally, we are insulting the Spirit of grace, the writer says. The Spirit of God continues to live within us even when we run after false worship or engage in a lifestyle of persistent sin. Thank you, Jesus. So when we sin in these ways, we drag the Spirit along with us. You see that? We insult Him by taking the enlightenment and empowerment of, of, of it all He has granted us and then throw it away. Oh man, my toes are hurting today. So when we act in these ways, there is no get out of jail free card. This is my point. Just because, let me boil this down in layman's terms for myself. I think this is more for myself. Just because you are a Christian or a believer doesn't mean that you get out of jail free anytime you flash the Jesus card. Man, Ben, you're kind of being kind of being uh, kind of sharp today. Yeah, so here's the thing is you can't suspect or expect life to be perfect, prosperity, blessing, you have nothing in Scripture that says, we have nothing in Scripture that says, just because Christ has forgiven me for that sin and that sin and that sin, that means that you, human beings, and my family, my friends, you should too. 
I've had many, many people do this to say, you know, you should just get over it. Jesus got over it. Jesus forgot my sin and so should you. Well, the, as the interesting aspect about that and, and, and uh, correlating this, lining this up with this section of scripture, you start seeing the heart of God. You see, the heart of God is broken. It's broken for you. And there's no such thing as a get out of jail free card as we act and perform our certain sacrifices to false gods, in essence, that we reset some sort of get out, you know, get out of jail free card. That's a thing of the Monopoly game. That's not something that's legit, that doesn't actually exist. Of course, our sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ, guys. Of course, their sin, our sin is forgiven. Eternally forgiven if we if we've placed our faith in Christ. But we will never experience the we will never experience the penalty of those that sin demands, which is a second death, because of that blood. Remember this, guys. But there is still, but there's a big but. <laughs> but there is still a judgment for the believer. If the Jews under the old covenant, a lesser covenant, faced a severe penalty for failing to obey the, the truth, what consequence do you think awaits a believer who disobeys the new covenant? Think about that. We remember that in verse 25, the writer made mention of the day drawing near. Remember this? We understood that to be the reference of the judgment for believers. It's that day he's alluding to as he calls to mind the expectation for all of us to receive judgment for our willful sinning. This is the judgment seat of Christ, guys. And it's the judgment where the Lord assesses our life service. What we did from day one to day last. What we did with this skin suit. As Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 3, check that out sometime. The outcome is a test like passing precious metal through a refiner's fire. Those with good testimony will receive a reward, while those test God who test God's patience during our life will see a consuming fire. Consuming them? No. Consuming their reward. So picture all the rewards that you were supposed to receive being consumed in a huge fire. That's the, that's, I'm, just, I'm just telling you what it says. So 1 Peter 4, verses 15 through 17, I found this. Check this out. It says this, Make sure that none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but it is to be glor glorified, glor is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, will, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Just in case there's any doubt, the writer is talking about true believers, not, on, not unbelievers who pretended to be a Christian. That's where that verse comes in. First, we see the context of these chapters have clearly been focused on who? Unbelievers? No. Believers. Throughout chapter 10, the writer has been speaking in terms of we. We, which means he's placing himself among this group. And he says that, that they have a confession of faith they need to hold on to. They're believers, guys. They're, he's not talking about non-believers. And they have forsaken assembling together, indicating that they're, they're the part of the congregation. And the three offenses they commit against God, the lettuces, um, are offenses that can only be committed by who? Believers. Yep. Trampling Christ is only possible if you have a relationship with him first. When an American soldier becomes a traitor during the war, we might say that he trampled underfoot the American flag. He brought shame to America. This is a good example. He brought shame to America because he had special relationship to the nation that he belonged to. Likewise, only a Christian can bring shame to Christ once he's a citizen, a, a, a Christ citizen, because of the relationship we have with him. Secondly, regarding the blood of the covenant as unclean can only be the offense of a Christian. To regard as unclean means to as, act as if the blood is common. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the person has been cleansed by that blood now, 
though now they act as if they didn't clean them at all. It didn't clean them at all. As the writer says, that this is the blood by which he was sanctified. Past tense. In the back rearview mirror. Lastly, I'll make my point, only a believer can insult the spirit of grace. Only a believer can insult the spirit of grace. God places his spirit inside every believer as a guarantee for their future resurrection and inheritance. Only a believer has that kind of relationship with God. Nobody else. Unbelievers may ignore the gospel, certainly, but they can't insult the spirit that they don't even know. So, if a believer disobeys the truth they have come to know that in the new covenant, then the writer says, remember, your Lord is one to repay in kind. Hmm. So let's check out verse 30 to 31. The writer quotes from the Old Testament to remind his readers that the Lord has a history of repaying and judging those he saves. Notice at the end of verse 30, the Lord says he will judge his people. Once again, he's talking about a judgment for a believer. And this judgment can be severe, guys. It's, it's not just, oh man, I, I was taught so wrong. We don't know how that judgment will go, go down, guys, um, for those who forsake the Lord. But this was, is what we can say. It's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of an holy God, a living God. Does it challenge you to consider that? Is it make you, does it push you a little bit? To consider our judgment moment can include terror. Man, well, what do we really find in the Bible? Where can we find this? You know, where can we find some answers? Is it just going to be lollipops and fairies and fun? Or is there going to be some terror involved? Well, Moses, check, check us out. Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, and others all demonstrate unreserved fear and trembling when the Lord appeared before them. And those weren't even moments of judgment. You see, we, we kind of imagine this picture of Christ as this, as this homie or like Santa Claus or like this cuddly little huggable person. Scripture shows us, even in the first books of Revelation, you can see the, the or the, the, um, the incarnate Christ or the... Um, the, the Mount of Transfiguration, a transfigured, uh, glorified body. He is intense. It's, it's intensely terrifying to fall in the hands of a living God. And then intention, and intentional lives of an apostasy or severe disobedience. This is what I'm talking about. This is, this is like repaying an in-kind. One day, each one of those people that I just mentioned must stand before the holy and awesome creator God to answer for how he served him. It will be terrifying because we will be without excuse. We will know we didn't heed the word of God and only then will we understand what we put at risk when we sin willfully. Our eternal life will be secure for sure, but this isn't the consolation according to the scripture. Nor can it become license for us to live in disobedience. This is, this is the tension that lives in Scripture, and it's good. We have been saved by grace for the penalty of our sins. <clears throat> Period. The sacrifice of Christ once for all is sufficient and saved us and reconciles us to God. But with our faith and salvation comes an expectation that we serve the Master who bought us. We must not turn back. We can't insult the spirit of grace nor trample underfoot the, the Christ who saved us. And if we shrink back, becoming lazy and seek after false worship, as Hebrews lays out, we should fear the Lord. We should fear the consequences. Because the Lord himself says he will repay and he will judge. Keeping both these perspectives in mind, we will assure us a jo joyful life of service to an exacting, perfect master, who stands ready to reward those who please him. Like all the warnings in the letter, the writer ends with an encouragement that, thank you, God, it's not too late. Let's read this together. Chapter 10, verse 32 through 39. I'll read it here. But remember the former days, when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering, part 
partly being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who are so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyful the seizure of your property, knowing that you have yourself a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Confidence, reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was been what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. The writer hopes to stir these stern words have shocked the conscience of the reader. Has it shocked you? And he says, it's time to wake up and get back on the straight and narrow path. Are you ready to get back on that? Remember the former days, the earlier days, when everything in our faith was new and we were excited to follow the, and obey Christ. I, I, heard about, I heard this pastor use a quote, and I'm going to butcher it, but he said something of this nature. I don't care how high you jump on Sunday morning. I care about how straight you walk all six other days of your life, of the week. And that reminds me of this. You remember when you were a first believer before the enemy created any confusion in your life? <laughs> I can't. Before our flesh tempted us to fear and desire the distractions. They, you know, lived in faith and by the Spirit. And, and I remember I did deeds in keeping with my faith. But it wasn't soon, it was soon after that where I started falling into the, the persecution and I suffered persecution for my faith. Even though I, get, I lost all my friends, I gave thanks to God. I, I lost this and I lost that, but I gave thanks to God and even more persecution came. I think about my, my kids right now who are struggling to stand out in the crowd. They can't have friends because they don't agree with they can't hang with that cer certain lifestyle or that certain behavior. I'm watching them wrestle with that. The, the, it was exactly the same way in the Jewish Christians in the earlier church. When they were commonly persecuted by fellow Jews, sometimes they would get murdered. They were in prison. They were beaten. They lost their lives as martyrs. But why? 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 Why did that happen? Because they knew their persecutions were tests from the Lord and they were passing with flying colors. <laughs> See what I mean? When, when someone comes up to me right now and asks me how's things going, I, I have a hard time telling them, you know, oh, it's just horrible. Because I actually am not scared of dying. I'm not fearful of pain. Why? Because we, we know trials and tribulations are means of passing with flying colors. When trials and pains and tribulation come in our life it's not a bad thing i didn't become a christian so i could be blessed and as as you endure these trials you know that you're earning treasure in heaven it's awesome man when we're living in the spirit instead of our flesh we're, we're powerful lights in the darkness we may endure persecutions as a christian inevitably do every day but we endure them gladly and with our testimony intact you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, like, why Why is it that some people have life harder than, than others? And, I'm, and I, I say, I don't know. I don't know, you know. But I do know that God uses trials, pain, attacks from the enemy, disease. I know he uses them. He will sometimes permit them. Um, I also know that sometimes it's the only way to actually get me corrected it's the best teaching tool out there and sometimes i stall in my spiritual growth because i'm so comfortable you know sometimes i think well i don't really have that much persecution i don't really have that much life's pretty good well it's because i'm really not a threat i've silenced myself satan doesn't need to silence me i'm silenced myself i've went in my corner and i've i've isolated myself from all pain all dirtiness and I've created my little world. Eventually, at some point, we have to look heavenward and stop looking earthward. <laughs>
and and they you got to begin to to long for the stability of the peace that surpasses on understanding a peace a peace that's beyond our capabilities just by ourselves a peace that's way better than going just with the crowd so as living with a jew accepted in their culture instead of a christian they were despised as a christian they were despised and rejected like christ himself their apostasy wasn't a matter of religious convictions it was a matter of convenience as the writer says they were seeking to avoid persecution just like today i don't know that we have a lot of pastors or teachers teaching the word of god this word of god the, the word of god that says there's nothing about prosperity in this gospel except for our eternal resurrection hallelujah for that and i don't want to be avoiding persecutions and thereby rendering me silenced for jesus to not shine my light right they just like back in the day they were more interested in saving their skin and their wealth than honoring the lord who died for them as the writer says in verse 35 they threw away all of that confidence it wasn't even an issue it wasn't lost they gave it up to gain something earthly so so in verse 35 and 36 the writer reminds his reader that they ought to throw away not throw away their confidence excuse me not throw away their confidence in the promise of christ because this is a great reward at stake it's way different than ground or a house or a car our endurance, he says, will be rewarded. Whatever the will of God may be for each one of us, if we accept it and live up to it, then we may expect to receive what has been promised to us. We may not know specifically what the Lord has in store for us, but remember, here's a cool little verse in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9. Just as it's written, it says, Things which eye has not seen or ear has not heard and which, not, which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. It's a killer memory verse. So we can be sure that whatever reward awaits for us to, as, who serve God faithfully, it will be well worth the sacrifice the Lord asks us to make down here. <laughs> Moreover, the writer reminds us that the wait will not be long when considered in an eternal perspective. The Lord is coming in a very little writer, <laughs> very little while, the writer says in verse 37. <laughs> And the writer will live, and, and the righteous will live by faith without shrinking back. For those who dare to shrink back will not please God. So, so finally, in conclusion, the writer declares optimistically that his that his readers will not be among those who shrink back and the, and suffer the penalty. Instead, they will live like those of faith. He's saying, "Don't be a believer who lives like an unbeliever." Period. Can I just sum it up like that? you've heard one thing hear me hear, hear me say this don't be a believer that acts like an unbeliever who lives like an unbeliever for doing so results in destruction of your witness and your reward the double r your witness <laughs> double r w r witness and reward instead be a believer who lives like a believer be a believer who lives like a believer for in doing so you are living out a witness that is keeping with your faith which has the power to preserve your soul. Think about that. In other words, your physical life should reflect your spiritual life. How about you today? Does your spiritual life reflect your physical life? And the other way around, does your physical life reflect your spiritual life? If you are saved by faith to serve God into eternity, then your life should reflect now that reality. Obey and serve Christ now as you will in the kingdom don't wait that sounds ridiculous doesn't it and if you do you will be rewarded in ways beyond your our imagination if you don't you will lose something far greater than you stand to gain on this earth in this life amen i hope you guys uh followed along in that last section of chapter 10 as we looked at the three lettuces and the fourth warning of the writer of hebrews next week we dive into examine the book uh the chapter 11 of hebrews and i'm so looking forward to seeing you then until then be blessed keep studying scripture and go out and love somebody the way christ loves that somebody Amen.
integrated.